all-new Chrysler brand introduced its top-of-the-line Imperial in 1926. Initially called the Imperial 80, indicating its guaranteed sustainable cruising speed, presuming you could find a road you could go that fast on. It was offered in five body styles on 120, 127, and 133-inch wheelbases. It used Chrysler's biggest redhead straight six at 289 cubic inches, or 4.7 liters, producing 92 horsepower, more than many eighths of the period. They had a distinct scalloped radiator shell and winged Viking helmet radiator cap to distinguish them from other lesser Chryslers. It could do 60 in under 20 seconds, was used as the Indianapolis 500 pace car, and set a transcontinental speed record. Prices range from roughly $3,000 to well over six for custom coach-built variants. 1928 added an extended 136-inch wheelbase version as the 80L Limousine, with a bigger 5.1 liter, 310 cubic inch straight eight, with up to 112 horsepower. The three-speed manual was replaced by a four-speed for 1930. All new versions arrived for 1931 that included a V-shaped grille and an eight-cylinder, now including custom bodies by LeBaron. Six body styles were available on 135 and 145 inch wheelbases, the straight eight was a 6.3 liter, 384 cubic inch variant with 125 horsepower. Safety glass and hydraulic brakes were now standard. Starting price was down to $2,800, making it almost affordable. A shorter version was added for 1933 with a 125 inch wheelbase and a smaller 299 cubic inch, 4.9 liter straight eight with 100 horsepower and only the three speed. For 1934, the Imperial moved to the airflow styling with early unitized construction, the 34 Chryslers being the first cars developed using a wind tunnel. Power brakes were now standard, and it was the car of the future available today, according to Chrysler. It was offered on 128, 137, and 146 inch wheelbases, with prices starting just above $1,600. Base engine was a 5.3 liter, 324 cubic inch straight eight with 130 horsepower, while the 384 was up to 150 horsepower. The three speed manual was standard on all versions with an optional overdrive four speed. The 37 Imperial got an extended nose to make them look somewhat more conservative, but it would be the last year of the airflow. All new models were back to body on frame with more conservative styling. Wheelbases were down to 121 and 140. The 324 was now the optional engine with 130 or 138 horsepower. And the new base engine was a 4.5 liter, 274 cubic inch version with 110 horsepower. The brake drums were increased to 13 inches and starting price was almost down to $1,000. For 1938, wheelbases were up to 125 and 144 and the brakes were increased to 14 inch in 1939. Styling was updated for 1940, only on 146 inch wheelbase. The 324 was the only engine offered in 132 and 143 horsepower tunes, backed by a three speed overdrive manual or a semi automatic. The brakes were back down to the standard 12 inch, and price was back up to $2,200. Post-war 46 model was mostly unchanged. Outside of minor trim updates, horsepower was 135. The new for 1949 models were conservatively styled, but came with four-wheel disc brakes standard, a $400 option on other Chryslers. Engine was unchanged, and the only transmission was the Presto-Matic four-speed semi-automatic. With a $4,600 starting price, it came on a 132-inch wheelbase or a long 146 inch wheelbase Imperial Crown. Like other Chryslers, 1951 saw the arrival of the 331 Firepower Hemi with 180 horsepower. 1953 models got a new two-speed Power Flight Automatic and optional Air Temp Air Conditioning, a $500 option. An Imperial Custom Newport Hardtop Coupe was added to the lineup, and it would see the beginning of the Imperial Parade Phaetons. A handful of custom bodied cars used in parades for publicity. In 1955, Imperial became its own brand in an attempt to better compete with the likes of Cadillac, Lincoln, and Packard. But they were still sold through Chrysler dealers, 
and were often still referred to as Chryslers in both the media and by competitors. And it still looks similar to the lower-priced Chryslers, sharing the 300's grille, but with distinct trim that included freestanding taillights. The 223-inch long car, now running on a 130-inch wheelbase and weighing 4,700 pounds. The disc brakes went away, but the 331 Hemi was up to 250 horsepower. Prices started at $4,500, and first-year sales were under $12,000. For 56, hardtop versions were now called Southamptons, available as 2 or 4 R, and the top trim level took on the name LeBaron, the coach builder having been incorporated into Chrysler in 1953. Wheelbase was up to 133, length 230, and it gained another 200 pounds, while the rear fender bulge was restyled into more of a fin. The Hemi V8 was up to 354 cubic inches, and 280 horsepower and 380 pound-feet of torque. Automatics became push-button with an optional three-speed torque flight, and Imperial offered the first transistor car radio, a $150 option. But it would be the last year of the parade patents. The 1957 models would be on their own platform, separate from Chrysler, but still sharing the 325 horsepower, 392 cubic inch Hemi V8. The base Imperial was 5 inches longer and 2.5 and inches wider than a Chrysler New Yorker, having the most shoulder room of any regular production car ever. It came in base custom, mid-ranged crown, and top-of-the-line LeBaron trim levels. Reinforced frame, power seats, and dual exhaust were standard. Quad headlights were optional. Tail lights were less freestanding and more George Jetson Sparrow Catcher, and it was available with the Flight Sweep deck fake spare tire hump, inspired by the Continental, which earns the unfortunate nickname, the toilet seat cover. With more than 37,000 sold, it was by far Imperial's best year. The 58 model would be the first production car with cruise control, called Autopilot, and power door locks were another new option. For 1959, Imperials moved to their own factory, and with the exception of a few early limousines, Imperials switched to a 413 wedge which produced 25 more horsepower than the outgoing 392 Hemi and weighed 100 pounds less. New options included swivel seats and either a silver crest stainless steel or leather look Landau top. With sales just over 17,000, Imperial would just edge out Lincoln for 1959 and 60. While other Chrysler products switched to unibody for 1960, the Imperial remained on its own full perimeter frame. But the body was moved forward on the frame, shifting overhang and cab space. Wheelbase remained 129 inches, but length was up 2 inches to 226. The interior was all new, with a squared-off steering wheel and electroluminescent instrumentation. On early 60 models, the swivel seats were set up to swivel with the door opening, but this turned out to have a safety concern and was quickly dropped. For 1961, the tail lights were once again freestanding, and now the headlights were as well. Tail fins would peak this year for the Imperial, and sales declined to nearly 12,000. 62 models got subdued fins, still with freestanding tail lights, and the torque flight transmission housing got smaller and lighter, being aluminum instead of cast iron. A LeBaron Eagle hood ornament was added, and lower compression reduced horsepower by 10. As its limited sales didn't warrant its own factory, production was moved back alongside Chrysler. The freestanding taillights went away for 1963, and it would be the last year for the freestanding headlights. New conservative styling arrived for 1964, inside and out. The square steering wheel and electroluminescent lighting were gone, but there was a giant eagle hiding the center fuel filler cap. It was styled by Elwood Engel, who also did the 61 Lincoln Continental, and the similarities were obvious. The cars carried over the same platform and wheelbase, but gained another inch and a half in length. These cars would become known as some of the most substantial ever in terms of ride, stability, and having an unfair advantage in demolition derbies. Sales would be up dramatically to over 23,000. The push-button transmission went away in 1965 in favor of the standardized column shifter, and the headlights now had glass covers. 66 models got 24 karat gold bands on the glass headlight covers, 
and the 413 was replaced by a 440, bringing horsepower back up to 350. It was the last year of the Imperial platform, as well as the 50s-style wraparound windshield, and for some, it was the last real Imperial. The all-new model for 1967 moved to the C-body platform all other large Chrysler products had moved to in 1965, which meant significant weight loss and a decrease in interior and exterior dimensions. Wheelbase was down by 2 inches, length 3 inches, and weight more than 150 pounds. Styling was updated to look more like a Chrysler and less like a Lincoln. 81, 1967, and 68 Imperials were produced with the Mobile Director Package that attempted to turn the Imperial into a mobile office and included a rear-facing front passenger seat and a desk. Fuselage styling arrived for 1969 with the bumper wrapped around the grill and hidden headlights. Length was back up to 230 inches and weight nearly 5,000 pounds. But sales jumped back up to 22,000 after seeing declines over the last few years. The 1971 Imperial became the first car available in America with four-wheel anti-lock brakes. Styling updates for 1972 were intended to make the car look more imposing, as if it didn't already have the mobster look down. But the look required the addition of bumper guards for 1973 to meet new safety regulations. And after almost consistently being America's lowest selling regular production car, it looked like the Imperial was in its last year. But one last attempt was made to revive the brand with new, more modern styling, as well as the return of optional disc brakes and the first car in America to offer a car alarm, all of which failed to be enough with 1974 sales barely improving over 1973. In 1976, the Imperial name was dropped and the car was decontented and rebadged as the new Chrysler New Yorker Braum. With a $2,000 price drop to $6,700, sales climbed to $39,000. But the model designation would return a few years later in 1981, introduced as a personal luxury coupe to compete with the Cadillac Eldorado and Lincoln Mark VI. Although it was not marketed as a Chrysler, the Imperial brand technically no longer existed. It was a rear-drive car based on the second-generation Chrysler Cordoba with a fuel-injected 5.2-liter V8 with 140 horsepower. But it was late to a market that was falling from favor and would only last three years, with just over 11,000 being made, in spite of a Frank Sinatra special edition. The name would be revived again in 1990, as a better equipped version of the New Yorker 5th Avenue, this time with full Chrysler badging. Although styling cues would be taken from the early 80s car, it was the only front wheel drive Imperial and the only one without a V8, using a 147 horsepower, 185 pound feet of torque 3.3 liter V6 its first year, and then upgrading to a 3.8 liter V6 with 150 horsepower and 215 pound feet of torque this time lasting through 1994, after just over 41,000 were made. Chrysler has toyed with bringing the Imperial back again, but so far has not gotten past the prototype stage. But in an ever-changing market, there is no telling when we may see a need for a higher-end Chrysler. Until then, as always, thanks for watching. Don't forget to comment below and like and subscribe.